So in this uh, second uh, presentation, I will address the, the assessment of the engineering aspect important to safety. Also, this, in, in several cases, will be a further elaboration of what you already heard. But I think uh, to repeat this important concept is not, uh, does not hurt. Huh? So it can be fixed in your mind, uh, in your mind a little better. So I'll talk about the, the engineering aspect in the IAEA safety standards. So I will try to, to, to limit my discussion to what is a, in the agency safety standards, or what is the agency position. Because when we are going in the technological field, you can really uh, have different, uh, different approaches, different solutions. So uh, I try to follow as much as possible what is in the standard of the agency, in the requirement and safety guides. So I will uh, try to explain what is in our view the difference between safety assessment and safety analysis, what is what we call safety analysis and what we call safety assessment. Then uh, uh, some uh, very short consideration on the, how the engineering aspects or where the engineering aspects are uh, addressed in the safety analysis report. And then something on the evaluation. So the term engineering aspects or engineering aspects important to safety was used in the uh, first time, in, uh, at least in the agency standard, because it's a general term, you know, so you don't really need a standard of the agency to address this, is, uh, was in NSG 1.2, Safety Assessment and Verification on NPP. This was the first standard where there was a distinction between at least an attempt to put some order in the safety assessment and in the safety analysis. Now these things are codified in the requirements, so there is no uh, confusion anymore. The, ter the term, this term is never used in uh, SSR 2 slash 1. You never find this term. But you find a lot of requirement that address the, this aspect. And uh, so, and uh, the, the term engineering aspects they, they, they don't use the word engineering aspect in, of, uh, important to safety, but since it's in a safety requirement, is something related to safety, so it's obvious, is uh, used in explicitly in the safety assessment for facilities and activities is one of the requirements that uh, uh, Tony showed this morning. Don't get upset with me if I keep showing this, but in this figure, there are a lot of messages. Going back to the requirement number eight, this that is evident, violet here, is prevention of accidents, you see. So the, the strong effort for achieving the, the main objective is prevention of accident. How do you prevent the accident? Can you tell me, someone, just how you prevent an accident? How the microphone? I think this is maybe. Make, let, let's uh, collect few, few positions. Then I can articulate a little more. Do you need the accident analysis to prevent the, the accident, or? Dito? Avoid to have a problem. Uh, uh, start to start to study the problem and improve an engineering problem or a solution to try to avoid the problem you could imagine in the past. What are the problems first? What kind of problems you want to avoid? Release of material to the environment. They have a name. This problem. One is called failure. Okay. So you don't want your equipment to fail. And the other one is malfunctioning. So you don't want the parameters that you have in normal operation, they go outside of the range. These are 
if you keep the parameters in the range, if no, nothing breaks in your, in your plant, you don't have any accident. So you have to do, most of your effort should be to prevent failure and prevent malfunctioning. That means you want to, to produce what we call a robust design, robust, strong design. The problem is how you do this. You do this through a strong implementation of all this engineering aspect that are affecting the quality, the strength of material, the margin, the proper implementation of the defense in depth. So this is what you have to do. So dealing nuclear safety, most of people think that is a, there is one strong message, that very simple message, I think is the only message in this, per, in, in this presentation, that the people are focusing very often, they confuse the term safety assessment and safety analysis with transient accident analysis, thermohydraulic calculation. This, of course, is a relevant part. It's recognized in the defense in depth. If something goes wrong, you have to know what you're doing. But first of all, you have to avoid that things are going wrong. So that is what we are talking in, in, this, uh, in this presentation uh, this afternoon. Huh? And that is how the principle eight is spelled out. All practical effort must be made to prevent and also to mitigate the, the accident. But first, the effort should be in prevention. So we should not forget this. And then, how do you prevent if you have a strong implementation, implementation of the defense in depth, effective management system? These are concepts quite general and uh, that you are very familiar with, I'm sure. But you see, adequate site selection, incorporation of good design and engineering features, providing safety margin, diversity, redundancy, all engineering rules that are uh, that are aimed at preventing, mostly preventing accidents. Design technology and materials of high qual quality and reliability. Control, limiting and protection systems, surveillance feature, and, and so on. So there are a lot of engineering rules that you have to apply, engineering approaches that you have to apply in your design, really mainly to prevent. Of course, the engineering aspects, they are cross-cutting because you you design with good engineering rules, also protection system, also the containment, everything. So they affect also the mitigation of accidents, but mostly they are important for the prevention because this is where the big effort uh, should be done. This is uh, the slide. Uh, I just want to show how these uh, terms, uh, engineering aspects, uh, enters in our standard because uh, very often our standards are not fully consistent, so in some cases the, the family of engineering aspect is uh, quite small, in other is quite larger, but I mean this uh, is, I don't think is uh, very important. You see here, this is uh, the, the flow for the safety assessment, and uh, you see the safety assessment uh, includes, uh, includes the, the safety analysis, is the safety assessment, the safety analysis is a part, and then there are other aspects that we have to, to take care of, and one of this is the engineering aspects. And then in this, uh, in the, so for example, human factor is not considered as an engineering aspect in this, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, standard, but is an, is something that is important to safety. So really this distinction for our purpose is, is, not, uh, is not very important. But what this, this uh, slide shows, we have engineering aspect, another aspect, and we have safety analysis. That is another, another point. Huh? I, I will come back to this because this is, I think, uh, is important. And you can see here, this, uh, this, this, sub, this distinction between, the safe, between safety analysis and safety assessment was also introduced many years ago in this safety guide 1.2. So the safety assessment is a general, you have to have this in mind. 
when, at least in the language of the agency, because uh, you know, in other places uh, they can have different definitions. But when we talk about safety assessment, is a general assessment. It's an assessment of the safety of the plan, of everything. When we talk about safety analysis, we, we talk about deterministic and probabilistic analysis, and this is analysis normally is limited to transient and accident. So we have a fault, we have an evolution of this fault, the consequences and the probability, and we are able to calculate with deterministic method the consequences of this fault, so determine what is the status of the plant at the end or at some point of this sequence. And with the probabilistic, we can associate a number of the probability to reach that situation. So at safety analysis, we are talking about accident analysis, and we talk about the transient analysis. When we talk about the other part, the assessment of engineering aspect, we talk about many other aspects that are some have been mentioned this morning, the proof engineering practices, how the defense in depth is implemented, radiation protection, the safety classification, the protection against internal and external hazards, the loads and load combination that we use for the design of a system, how we select the material, single failure criteria, redundancy, equipment qualification, aging, and human-machine interfaces. So all these aspects should be considered to, to rate the safety of a plant, to make a complete safety assessment. The analysis of the accident, the analysis of a transient is very important, but is a part. It's not the full picture. Because if I, if I have a very good system, but I, you know, I have an accident every day, every day I have a failure, every day, then, so this is not a safe plant, of course. So first of all, all efforts on prevention, good design. Then the assumption that something can be wrong anyway. So we have to be prepared to answer. So this we have seen of this uh, this morning. That is a, is, a, is a standard that is for the design and for the assessment. And this is can be used also to assess the the, uh, the engineering aspect because all the engineering there are requirements for each of the the, the, the engineering aspect that I uh, mentioned to you. Designing structure, system, and components according to the requirement established for engineering aspect provides a robust design. That means a strong prevention of failures and effective protection of people. The assessment of engineering aspect ensures, together with the safety analysis, that all the acceptance criteria are met and the plant perform as intended from a safety point of view. So there are two aspects very important in the assessment, the safety analysis and the assessment on the engineering aspect. Keep this in mind. So this is how uh, the, the problem is addressed in the requirement uh, 10 of uh, the safety GSR part four. It shall be determined in the safety assessment whether a facility or activity uses to the extent practicable structure, system, and components of robust and proven, de proven design. And then you see there is a, a list of all these aspects that we have already seen, so we don't, have, we don't have to go through this again. And in this, in this standard, the, in addition to the engineering aspect, there are other aspects, but we can keep uh, these two treat these two families together because really the, the subdivision is artificial. So this, uh, again, is the equipment that we have to design against uh, the, with the, this uh, observing and following all the rules for the um, engineering aspects. But don't forget that when we are talking about safety, we are dealing only with items important to safety. So items, if they fail, they have a radiological consequence, direct or indirect. There is one consideration to do. You see, in this figure, 
this figure here reflect the situation in SSR2, uh, the, old, the, old, uh, the old requirement for the design, NSR1. This was the equipment. Now, in SSR2 slash 1, we introduce this design extension condition. So also this figure needs to be amended, but it still has not been done in the glossary of the agency. Because also the safety, also the safety features for design extension condition are items important to safety. Also in general, they can have IMC part, actuation system, and support system. Why we have to consider separately and not together? Because the design rules that we are going to follow are different. We don't design with the same, following the same approach and the same rules. We mentioned this morning that we don't, uh, uh, we, we have a conservative approach in design this. We don't have, we have a best estimate approach designing this. We require the single failure criteria here. We don't require the single failure criteria. And then also when we classify, and then we will discuss this a little more tomorrow, when we classify these systems, they follow in a different safety class. Hmm? So it's important to keep these two things separated. But unfortunately, in the, in, the, um, in the glossary of the agency, you find this old figure yet has not been changed. But this should, should be done. Then where? We have to provide the demonstration that all these engineering aspects are addressed correctly. It has to be done in the safety analysis report. There is, I think uh, most of you have experience with the safety analysis report. And according to what, what I said before, should be called safety assessment report rather than safety analysis report, at least in the language of the agency because this is a general document that covers everything, not only the accident analysis. But anyway, this is tradition to call safety analysis report, so we refer to safety analysis report. So here, we have, a, this is a standard of the agency, is GSG 4.1, and is the format and content of the safety analysis report of nuclear power plant. So it's a, a safety guide, it's a, a standard a level of safety guide that uh, gives you the information what has to be included in the safety analysis report. And then I will ask you in this list of content, where do you see the engineering aspect important to safety that we mentioned before? In which chapter? Can we start? Chapter one, okay, is introduction that we can skip. General plant description. Yes or no, ni. There are three possibilities. Of course, they are not addressed in all. The, the, you see, there is one chapter so let's say that we have here in the structure of the agents, then I will show other structures, but in the structure of the agency, we have 15 chapters. And uh, we have uh, chapter six, for example, is a single chapter, but addresses all the major systems of the, of the nuclear power plant. They're all together, containment, emergency, core um, cooling emergency systems, uh, all the, the reactor core, primary cooling system, are all addressed in the, in the same chapter. But so that is the reason there are only 15 chapters. But you see, the, the, uh, the safety analysis is, is one chapter, huh? one chapter that is chapter seven in our uh, uh, safety guide. And I would say that the, 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 uh, the, re, the engineering aspect are are addressed in the general design aspects because there are the general aspects that are applicable to all systems here. The description and conformance of the design of the plant systems where there are typical aspects for each. 
Then there are radiation protection. If we include radiation protection, we consider also radiation protection as an engineering aspect, or so we have to do this. And probably radioactive waste management. So these are the main, the main chapter where the, so are, are distributed in the safety analysis report, but they occupy a large fraction of the safety analysis report. Here on the, on the left side is the, the, old, uh, the old regulatory guide structure of the old NRC, uh, regulatory guide 170. Now this regulatory guide is not updated anymore by the NRC, but I think uh, really deeply affected the structure of the majority of safety analysis report in the world. They, they all, all of them took inspiration from this safety guide and the reason is this safety guide is very detailed and you know, it's chapter, sub-chapter, sub-sub-chapter is described in, a very, uh, in very detail and so people were much, uh, and they had the reference also of the safety analysis report prepared in the United States to prepare their own. So this was one of the most uh, followed. And here, in this you see, from three to 10, these are in, uh, in blue, these are all the chapters that address engineering aspect too important to safety. Huh? Mm. And if you compare this with the structure of, uh, the, structure of the, the, the agency, we have only the, but mostly in the five, uh, five and, and six. Fortunately, it's not, uh, I don't know why it has not appeared at the bottom. And then in the, in the safety guide of NRC, the, the, oops, pardon. We have the accident analysis, where all the accidents are analyzed, is chapter 15, and the equivalent, uh, the equivalent in, the, in the agency is chapter seven. So I, I, say, I say these things because most of the safety analysis report that you can experience are very much, much closer to the RG170 than to the structure of the agency. So it is important to know this. Then NRC stopped the updating of the safety guide. The safety guide uh, 170 was published in 1978, so it's a very old document but have been used as a, a reference by many countries. Now, NRC, of course, in the, in the years, NRC changed the, changed the approach to the licensing, and now there is the combined licensing application, and uh, another regulatory guide has been prepared, and uh, that is a sort of replacement of uh, 170, is 1206, and in this safety guide, Two additional chapters were included, one on human factor, nothing was 170 at that time, and probabilistic res risk assessment and severe accident. Also, this was not addressed. When we, in 170, accident analysis is deterministic safety analysis only. In the agency, the accident analysis is, uh, safety analysis is probabilistic and deterministic. You know, in one chapter, we have both. Another very important document I think can be useful, and it's also universally recognized, is what is known as MUREC 800, so it is standard review plan. These are practically the rules how to review a safety analysis report. And this is really, if you follow this, you make a complete review of all chapter of safety analysis report. Of course, you do this following the rules of the United States, because this is American product. I mean, if you are, if you have different regulation, you have to be a little flexible in, in but this is very complete document. And another, I uh, would say, positive aspect, this document is constantly updated. So it's available on the web. If you go there, you find the latest version. If something is produced in a week, will be updated. So it's very, it's a good reference. So I think, uh, uh, whatever your regulations are, if you are involved, if you are involved in uh, review of any chapter of the safety analysis report, to have this on your desk can be can be useful. That is the reason I mention also if there are not documents uh, of the agency. Now I am going through the main uh, some important of uh, these uh, engineering aspects, 
and uh, recall basically the requirements. There will be a little boring presentation, so be ready. And what are the, the major aspects? And then the, in the following days, we will consider this again, not all of them, but the, the, the relevant, and in a dedicated lecture, we go much deeper, for example, in safety classification, in the equipment qualification, internal, external, other human factors. So we have a lot, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, lectures on, uh, on the different aspects. So you have the possibility to go little deeper and ask very detailed question to the, the lecturers. For regarding the, the proven engineering practices, all items important to safety shall be designed in accordance with the relevant national and international code and the standard. Because the, 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 the national and international uh, codes, they reflect the good practice, they reflect the experience, and they, they contain very uh, detailed design rules. So it's the easiest, we don't have to reinvent the, 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 the wheel every time. You know, if you have to design a pipe, or the primary pipe, or you have to design a vessel, you don't have to invent uh, rules. These things are already codified. You find a very recognized standard, a very high level, and you can follow this, and you are, you are confident that, uh, that uh, your design is correct, and also the safety authority can check if you follow some recognized standard. Doesn't make to criticize the standard. So is a, is a good way. Unfortunately, this is, a, is general, and for the majority of the, of the equipment you have in the plant, you have available codes. But when you start modifying, producing new concepts, new, a new design, and you really introduce new, new technologies, then maybe you don't find the codes, because the codes is prepared after, huh? follows the evolution of technology, does not anticipate. And so maybe you are, you are forced to introduce, to make a, a new assumption and uh, to, to design new equipment. So in this case, of course, you need research, you need testing, you need a specific uh, qualification procedure in order to prove that also this new design equipment meet the requirement you want, you set at the beginning. Eh? Of course, following the, using all the existing experience, using the, the existing codes is the easiest uh, way, but it's not always possible. And there is also this application of the codes should be done with intelligence, because should be understood what the codes is for. And really, if the code that you are using is a re exactly the, is the code that you need for your design, for your piece of equipment, so you have to know what is in the code, and you should know the applicability of the code. It's not just sufficient to take a code and follow. Maybe then you, you use the, the wrong one. Eh? So, but that is, uh, of course, this is a responsibility of the designer and the responsibility also of the safety authority that makes the review of the, your safety analysis report to see that if you make reference to some codes, these are the right codes for that uh, structure and uh, system and component. For defense in depth, we already said uh, several things, but this morning we presented defense in depth as a concept to origin the, the, the safety requirement. But in SSR 2 slash 1, there is a requirement that said your design shall follow the defense in depth. So it's something not is you're not free to do or not. You have to do. And you have to follow the defense in depth in the concept that is illustrated in, uh, in the document. So you have to design very well for normal operation. You have to design for anticipated operational occurrences. And you have to have systems to deal with this situation. You have to design for design-based accident. You have a system to deal with this situation. You have to design for design extension condition. And you have to have system for this. Huh? So that means what uh, the meaning of, uh, of application of the defense in depth. But I don't want to, to uh, bother you too much. 
There is, uh, we already mentioned this morning, the independence of level, but I would like just very quickly to mention again here the independence of level of defense in there, because this, is, this has a very strong impact on the design. That uh, implies that uh, we have uh, implies the addition of other system, implied a new design. Try to make uh, uh, to to make completely independent the auxiliary system, the supporting system like the power supply, compressor supply, some cooling, and so so is a big impact. Uh, this uh, uh, requirement uh, was not uh, is not in the in the current and uh, sorry SSR. Uh, is wrong here, SSR 2 slash 1, but in, is in the revised version. This is a, an addition to the, uh, to the, the current uh, um, requirement that is in the revised version that will be printed uh, very soon. So the, said the level of the defense in depth shall be independent as far as practicable. To avoid a failure of one level, reducing the effectiveness of other levels. Because, you know, if you, you one, fa one level, the failure one level uh, cause the failure of also other levels, the defense in depth that is organized in different levels is completely ineffective. You have more, more level because the subsequent level has to deal with the failure of the previous one. If they fail together, goodbye. And that is what uh, in Fukushima happened practically. In, uh, so in particular, safety feature for the design extension condition, this is required, especially feature for mitigating the consequences of accident involving the melt, so a severe accident, shall be as far as practicable independent of, the saf independent of safety systems. So the factors that affect the independence, we already mentioned, are the sharing of systems, you will never have a, a complete independence because there, is, there are always some common parts. At least there are common structures. You know, different safety systems, they, they are supported by the same concrete structure in many cases. And so also these systems are not completely independent. So as far as practical, this should be achieved. And uh, uh, one is a uh, typical example are the common power supply, the common cooling system or common structures, supporting structure. And the other are the exposure to common cause failure. So to, have, to, re to be really independent, they should be also independent with respect to external and internal hazards as much, uh, as, much as possible. So this is something that is, uh, so, Radiation protection, of course, all the measures should be implemented in the plant to protect the, the workers and the people. And, but there are, there are two aspects of the radiation protection. Because when we talk about accident analysis, you know, accident analysis, we, for each accident, we calculate the release practically. You start from a fault and you end to the release to the environment following this accident. So the evaluation of the radi radiation aspects for the public, people outside of the plant, are in the safety analysis part, in the accident analysis. So the radiation protection of the people is addressed in the, in the safety in the accident analysis, in the safety analysis part of the safety assessment report. And of course, there are different situations that also they are considered. One is the normal operation, plant uh, really uh, working normally during the, the year, and the releases and the doses should comply with the prescribed limits and should be as low as a reasonable achievable that Alara. So there are prescribed limits, value that the safety authority tells you. This is the maximum release that you have to have per day, per year, per month, it, it depends. So in, during the normal operation, because also in normal operation, the plant produce some radioactivity and this uh, radioactivity should be in a way or another eliminated, but the quantity of the, that we can 
we can uh, release uh, uh, to the environment is established, the maximum value is established by the safety authority. And this also should be proved and demonstrated in the safety analysis and should be in the safety analysis report because this is, is practically is the doses that the, the members of the public experiment more frequently because the plant operates every day. The accident may be never happen in the life of the plant, hopefully, so these are the doses that the members of the public are, are subjected to. Then for the accident conditions, here the approaches are a little, are not always the same. The releases and the doses evaluated in the accident analysis should comply with the acceptable limits. You see, we switch the terms from prescribed limits to the acceptable. Because for the, for the, for the accident conditions, of course, the public should be always protected. So the public should never have a dose that exceeded the limit established by the international body, like ICRP, like the agency. So these are, but during accident condition, this is uh, quite difficult to, to demonstrate. So the, the safety authority can, in some cases, accept some values. But they cannot impose, they don't normally don't impose this value, but they gave it an indication as a design target, you should not exceed the, the, this value. So this case, that is, while the, the prescribed limits are normally the same almost everywhere in the world, one or two millisieverts per year, the, the, the release for in the, in the accident is, uh, is not uh, so, the approach is not uh, so uniform. So, but what I want to say that we are dealing with the protection of public and the environment in the accident analysis. Regarding the protection of the workers, the situation is a little different because normally, normally in the safety analysis report, there is a dedicated chapter to this aspect. So all the aspects related to the protection of the workers in the plant are in this chapter. And I will go through very quickly what is the content of this uh, chapter. All actual and potential sources have to be identified. The materials have to be selected to minimize deactivation. The generation, transport of corrosion product and activation product shall be controlled. Provision shall be made for preventing the release of dispersion or radioactive substances inside, inside the plant. The plant layout should ensure that areas with radiation hazard and possible contamination are adequately controlled. So all of you that have the experience to enter a nuclear power plant, you know there are some areas that are blocked by a door. You need a specific bait to go in. You need some instrumentation for the measurement of uh, uh, radiation when you enter this area. But this is for people in the plant. Uh, the plant shall be divided in zones related to the aspect of occupancy and radiation levels. So there are normally in the plant different zones with different colors and they are separate uh, from each other. So I think this, if you have the experience to enter a nuclear power plant, uh, this is quite a general rules. I'm sure that uh, you have seen this. Shielding shall be provided to prevent all radiation level. Equipment subject to frequent maintenance or manual operation shall be located in areas of low dose rate. Of course, we cannot roast the operator that has to go to maintain a very radioactive, uh, radioactive component. And the facility shall be uh, provided for the decontamination of personnel and equipment shall be provided for radiation monitoring in operational state and accident. These are all these aspects that you will find in the chapter, in the chapter of um, dedicated to radiation protection. As I said before, this chapter deals with the protection of the works, huh? the plant, uh, the plant. Then another important aspect is the safety classification. I just uh, mentioned the, the basic concept here. Tomorrow we are going in, in a little more detail of this. So all items important to safety shall be identified and shall be classified on the basis of their function and the safety significance. 
that means that you have to imagine that each piece of equipment in the nuclear power plant has a label attached, tells you if this is important to safety or not. If it is important to safety, as a number, a letter, whatever, that indicates the importance of safety, uh, to safety of this component. So that should be done uh, thoroughly uh, through the plan. So we have to measure, we have to rank the importance to safety. How to do this? This is not uh, an easy task. In the requirement, we give uh, some criteria, at least in general terms. Uh, then in the safety guide, we try to be a little more specific. But you see what are the, the considerations we have to make to rank the importance to safety. First, what is the safety function to be performed? by that item. Second is the consequences of the failure to perform its function. So if this component, this structure fails, what is the radiological impact? Because we have to realize that not all the failures are the same for the consequences. Some can cause limited consequences. Some can cause large consequences. Some can happen very rarely. Some can happen more frequently. And this is another, another criteria. And then, and then we have also something related to the time. Some components, some system have to react very quickly in case of an accident. Other, and so they should be automatically uh, initiated, should be very reliable, and they should pr provide their performance in a very short time. So they should be designed for this. Other systems, maybe they are e equally important, but maybe they are needed much later. So there is more time. The system can be operated manually by the operator because the operator has time to, to understand the, the, the situation and has, has, has to have the procedure to, to start this equipment. So, there are, so these are the four, the four criteria that uh, we are uh, uh, giving in, uh, in, uh, in our safety standards. So the safety classification, why is important? Because it affects the design rules. Uh, an item in safety class one is designed with normally with more stringent rules than an item in a safety class two. Probably the equipment or uh, 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 SSIC in, uh, in a, I don't know, there's a telephone interacting. Uh, and um, so there is, uh, there are, uh, the equipment in different safety classes have different safety margins or different design margins. They are subjected to different uh, testing and maintenance rules. So there is a big impact. On this. Huh? So uh, classified one component in one class rather than into another has uh, impact, very strong impact on the cost, immediate cost in the design and manufacturing, but also cost during the life of the plant because it requires more frequent intervention. So you realize how this is, is something very important. And uh, also because of this, we had a lot of problem in the agency to prepare the safety guide on safety classification, you know, because there are different approaches in a different uh, in different member states, and they are not really keen to to change their approaches just because we write a rule on standard of the agency. So this is a very a very sensitive subject. Then we have the protection against internal and external hazards. Of course, the requirement said we have to, to all foreseeable internal hazard and external hazard, including the potential for human-induced events, direct or indirect effect, the safety of the plant shall be identified and their effect shall be evaluated. So hazard shall be considered for the determination of postulated initiating event and generating loadings for use in the design of relevant items important to safety for the plant. But you realize that uh, the hazards are not the same for all plants. Because the internal hazards, so those that are generated inside, 
the plant like a fire, like internal explosion, like forces due to pipe breaks or pipe whip, so this falling of objects, heavy objects, all these that are in the family of the internal hazard, they depend on a specific nuclear power plant, a specific design. But the external hazards are extremely uh, related to where the plant is located, to the site. So for each site, we need a, a careful as an evaluation to determine what is really the hazard, what are the different hazards for that specific site. And from this hazard analysis, then the designer, according to the rules established by the safety authority, will determine what is the, the specific value of the external events that he has to consider to design the structure. For example, if you have the seismic, uh, the seismic uh, uh, hazard analysis, you have a curve. There is the, the result of the analysis where you have, for example, a magnitude of the earthquake against the frequency. So you have very low frequency, very high magnitude, then, then you, the, the frequency increases, you have a much smaller. So you have what is an hazard curve. You are familiar with this another curve. Now, which value are you going to use for your design? This is, uh, of course, it, it, there are different approaches, but normally you, you use a value that is in the range, for example, uh, return period 10 at minus 4. That is the rule that people are following now, at least for some equipment. So you go to 10 at minus 4, and then from that you have the, you have the magnitude of the, this earthquake, and then, of course, you make the conservative consideration, you add margin and whatever. At the end, say, this is my design basis earthquake. I have to design my system or this family of system with this earthquake. That means I have to consider the loads of this earthquake and design for this. But, but you know, the plant is not uh, subjected only to the loads of the earthquake because at the same time there are other loads. Think about, about a pressurized component as loads generated by the pressure, loads generated by the temperature or gradients of temperature, and you have to combine these loads with the seismic load because the component has to continue to, 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 to function or should not break with all these loads combined. So all these aspects are very important, but there is a very wide literature on this, so and there are, uh, there are codes, so these are addressed in detail. You can find a lot of information. So for our purpose in this introductory uh, lecture, we, we just mention what are the internal hazards of interest. Normally, first is the fire, explosions, flooding. We are talking here about internal flooding. So floods that are caused by faults. We have a tank full of water, the tank break somewhere or a pipe and you flood something. Huh? So these are the internal hazard flooding. Then we have missile generation, and you know this because we have rotating equipment so you can have uh, missiles or can break a pressurized component can break and then generate missiles and so on. Then you have collapse of structures, so things that are falling down. So in your design you have to, if there is this risk, you have to avoid that items important to safety are below things that can fall. In particular case is the, the spent fuel, the pool of uh, where you store the spent fuel. You always avoid to move on top of these fuel heavy objects. It is, uh, there are many, many regulations. They really oblige you to follow this requirement. Nothing heavy should be moved on top of this equipment. So, uh, uh, during the, the when, when the, there is fuel in the pool. Then the pipe whip, you know, when a pipe breaks, can, can hit some other components and, other, and uh, uh, cause the failure of other components, especially, you know, if there are cabinets of an instrumentation, things that can be really uh, be destroyed by, uh, by being hit by the um, broken pipe or put jet impact when you have release of high pressure fluid. So all these things should be considered. So for each area of your plant, 
you have to make an analysis, what are the, the potential uh, hazards that you have, and then put measure for each of one that are uh, rather well codified uh, measure to implement. And this should be described in the safety analysis report. And if you revise, if you review the safety analysis report, you have to check if the identification of the hazard is complete, and you have to check if the measure implemented for each other are effective. So the external hazards, we have a category of natural and uh, human induced, also this I think Rick you know very well, the meteorological events in the natural, the so heavy rain, snow, ice, uh, depends on, on, on the areas, uh, heavy wind, hydrological events, geological events, seismic events and human induced, and we have, air, I would say that all these external hazards, there is one chapter normally in the safety analysis report, uh, for example, chapter two in 170, this is dedicated to the site evaluation. So all these consideration on external events, you will find in detail and should be in detail described in that chapter. For human induced, we have the uh, aircraft crashes, also this depends where the plant is located and uh, what you consider depends on the specific regulation of the country. Fla fire, explosion missiles outside of the plant, of course, and the releases of toxic gases. Maybe you can have a uh, railroad uh, passing by your plant and then on this railroad there are, uh, maybe can be some uh, dangerous fluid or uh, material can be transported and so can cause, can have an impact on the nuclear power plant. I think uh, we have uh, a dedicated lecture also to, uh, to the external events and one on the, on the in internal other. So you will uh, go to this um, in much uh, more detail. So here, how what we do to, pro to protect against uh, internal other, that just is very, simplified uh, list of topics. So we say items important to safety shall be designed and located to withstand the effect. So this is very easy to say, this is a requirement, no? because we know that this hazard exists, and so the, our equipment should be protected. Hazard, for example, fire, flooding, or earthquakes, this is something very specific of the ice, very important, could potentially impair several level of the defense. And what is uh, serious that an hazard, think about an earthquake, is shaking, it breaks a pipe, so it's causing an, ac an accident, but at the same time, if the earthquake is strong enough, can cause also the failure of your safety system that have to deal with that break. So, you know, you lose a different level of the defense at the same time. So the analysis of these others and the implementation on the, on the design are very, very important. And the others normally you know, are, are really the origin of the common cause failure, are really the main origin of common cause failure. So effective uh, protection against fire requires, for example, prevention of fire, so you should not accumulate material, combustible material, you have to have detection system, and the limitation of the consequences, creating separation and protected areas. So these are these are also uh, rules implemented in the in the conventional industry. I mean, it's not some even in the civil buildings. It's not something that is uh, specific for nuclear power plant. But the attention of nuclear power plant, because of the potential consequences, of course, should be much more. The design shall provide for adequate margin against level of external hazard derived from the site evaluation. Why this? Because the determination, the determination of uh, the hazard in a site, especially when we are talking about events that are uh, frequency of tenus minus four or minus five, are very rare. So the uncertainties in determining these values, even with uh, with the most advanced uh, technology and the knowledge is uh, as always large uncertainty. So we, we should be aware when we the, even the best institute for where there are the best uh, seismologists of the world give you a value 
you know, take it a little more just in case, you know. So this is the approach that is, and, uh, that, uh, is recommended here. The determination of, ex of rare event is by nature uh, affected by very large uncertainties, always. This is in the nature of the human world, I mean. The reliability of items important to safety and also the, uh, you see the reliability shall be commensurate with the safety significance. So that means if you assign a structure or system or components to a safety class implicitly, you are imposing a reliability on the system and reliability on components because they are things they go together. So, so that means that the structure important, uh, SSRC is important to safety shall be designed, qualified, procured, commissioned, operated and maintained to withstand with sufficient reliability the conditions specified in the design. The potential for common, this is always the, the most uh, tricky part, the potential for common cause failure shall be considered to determine the application of redundancy diversity and independence. So these three factors, redundancy, diversity, and independence are the means to achieve reliability. So use this to improve the reliability of your system in different conditions. The, then the single, single failure criteria shall be applied for a safety group. This is the way it's uh, written in the our requirement. And the principle of phase safe design shall be considered and incorporated into the design of system and component. Do you know what the phase safe design is? What is the concept of this is I think nuclear engineers should know this at least. Can you someone explain to everybody? Can you try? So, I mean, uh, what do we mean if we say fail safe? Uh, fail safe is when a system fails, it fails in, the, in a, favor, uh, a condition that's favor to, to safety. So, I mean, the situation uh, that you reach after the failure is a safe situation. Safe. No? Yeah. There are many examples, of course. Uh, one example is if you have an isolation system, so you want to isolate, if in case you have an accident or an event, you have to isolate a line or a containment or whatever, you, you, you make these isolation devices in such a way that something goes wrong. For example, they lose the, the power or they, pull, they lose the compressed air, they shut the, the line, so you go in the isolation status. That is what you wanted to achieve. But also this can be very tricky because what can be, <laughs> when you want in some situation could be avoided in the other. So it's not, uh, it's not so straight the application of, uh, of this criteria. In general, we can say that, but you know, can have also counter effects. So should be considered very careful you know? because there are some lines you don't want to isolate in some situations, so it's better that in this case it doesn't work. But there are, of course, there are considerations to do, but this is, as a general approach, is something to consider. So something goes wrong for any reason, and you achieve uh, a status that is safe. So also this, in general, should be followed. This is all, these are topics that are related to the reliability. Yeah? Then we have another requirement on calibration, testing, maintenance, and repair. Probably also this will be addressed uh, uh, maybe tomorrow or after in the, in the coming days. So the calibration, testing, maintenance, repair, replacement, inspection, and monitoring items important to safety. Items important to safety shall be designed to be calibrated, tested, maintained, repaired, replaced, inspected, and monitored as required to ensure their capability and of performing the function along the life of, of, of the plant. So it should be when something 
something important for safety. You have to ensure the, 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 the functionality of this equipment. So this equipment should be periodically tested, maintained, and checked. That is, uh, that are providing, even after many years of life of the plant, still providing the function, if required, provide the function as intended. The design shall be such that these activities can be performed according to relevant codes and over the lifetime of the plant and without undue radiation exposure to the workers. These are some general aspects to have in mind. For calibration, testing, and maintenance during power operation, the plant design shall be such that these activities are facilitated and performed with no significant reduction of the system reliability. Also, this requirement has a strong impact on the design. I think something was mentioned uh, by, by uh, Tony this morning. If you want to test, for example, a redundant, you have a redundant uh, system, that means uh, the, a simple redundancy, two. Two trains that can perform each 100% of the performance that is necessary, and you want to test one of these during the operation, you are forced to disconnect this system during the maintenance. So that means that is in the period of time, you have only one. So in this period of time, your single failure criteria is not valid. You, you are operating the plant without having a safety system responding to the safety, to the single failure criteria. So what do you do in these cases? There are different solutions. You can prove that the, the maintenance time is very short and you know, it doesn't affect uh, the globally the risk of the plant, or another solution more practical and now adopted at least for, for many systems is to put another one. So you put three systems, so even if you have one in maintenance, you have the single failure still. So there are different ways to, to deal with this, uh, this problem. But you see, when you, uh, I'm telling you these things, but if you have the, if you, in your profession, you have to, to write a safety analysis report or to review according to your role, a safety analysis report, these are all the aspects that you have to, to consider. So you cannot forget any of this. Equipment qualification, all this very, very important. I think also on this, if I'm not wrong, we have, uh, you are going to, to give a, a lecture on equipment qualification, so you will, will have all the details tomorrow. So qualification program, important is to understand if you are familiar or not familiar, what is the qualification. The qualification is really the demonstration, the practical proof, just to say in, 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 uh, in a few words, that the equipment is going to perform under all the possible conditions that you can postulate, is going to perform as wanted. If you want a pump, make an example, to work even under an earthquake or after an earthquake, you have to prove that this, you have to really to have confidence that this pump can, can really work as wanted under the earthquake. How can you do this? Of course, now there is a lot of experience. You can refer to similar equipment, similar design rules, but there is a very practical, practical way. It's just to test it in a real situation. And for some components, for some structure, for some uh, situation, it's possible to do this. I'm, I'm sure that you have seen several times these big components that are on a shaking table that is reproducing earthquake, and then you can check if really keep the, the, the component, whatever, keep working and functional as, as, as desired under this condition. Of course, you can do the same with uh, radiation, temperature, humidity for all the conditions that can occur during the life of the plant, during an accident, and when the component or whatever the system is, uh, is expected to work. So this is a very, so the, the qualification is a science because there are different methods, so I think you will hear tomorrow more than this, but the qualification, the seismic qualification is one of the most common other things you can qualify for high temperature, for uh, 
fire and, and so on. There is a, but this is also a very important aspect that should be addressed in the safety and hazard report. First, what you should know what are the most severe conditions and combination of conditions to which the, the, your equipment is subjected, and then prove that uh, the, it works as intended. Aging or, and wear out, of course, during the life of the plant, the, the characteristic of the plant, many of the characteristics of the plant are degrading, are changing because uh, the material is getting older, some material that are sub very much subjected to, to the variation of the properties. And there are the material, of course, is exposed to a cycle, mechanical cycle, thermal cycle, neutron irradiation. This is maybe tomorrow talking about the, the coolant system, the vessel, we will say something more on this. So, Really, the, the mechanical properties, the electrical properties, the insulation properties of the materials are changing with time. So you have to predict this and include also in this case margins and also to have the, the possibility to replace and to maintain this during the life of the plant. But this is something that you have to consider. And this is becoming more and more important because now there is the trend to extend the life, the life of the plant. Before they are talking about 30 years, when I was a student, it was 30 years. Now it's 60 years. So it's, it's growing, <laughs> they expect the life of the plant. So can you imagine in 60 years what can happen, you know? Some components, some materials, it's a, it's a very long time. So you have to have the possibility to, to deal uh, with all these aspects. Then human factor, also this is another very important aspect. Then the systematic consideration of human factors, including human machine interface, shall be included at an early stage in the design process for a nuclear power plant and shall be continued through the entire uh, process. Also, this, there are a lot of experience. The modern plants, of course, are much better than the old plants. And so there are, there are a lot of rules and there is a, a really a wide um, literature dealing with uh, aspects. But uh, some, as a general, uh, a general rules, the need of intervention by the operator on a short time shall be kept to a minimum. May I ask you why? Why you think the, the operator should uh, act as less as possible? Yes, of course, to, but why? He's not reliable, the operator, very well trained, he studied a lot, he was trained in the, the simulator. Yeah, he had a fight with the wife, maybe, and then he came to the, off, to the <laughs> nuclear power plant and there's a problem. Because the human is the, is the less reliable. You know? In the scale of reliability, the first are inherent features in the plant. Because these are intrinsic to the physics. These are very reliable. Gravity cannot be cancelled. Huh? And uh, heat transport is the same. So these are or, uh, some neutronic uh, uh, phenomena. You know? So these are intrinsic. So you, might, you can rely most on this. And your design should rely first on this intrinsic characteristic on physics. Second are the passive systems. In, in the scale of reliability. Then there are the active systems. The last one is the operator. So it's the, it's the weak point of the chain, the, the operator. So you should really, of course the operator is very important, but should be used with, <laughs> with care. And should have the, pro, the, the time to think, the time to, to, to recall what the procedures are for that specific situation should have the possibility to understand exactly what is, what is going on, because this is, in some cases, not so simple. And, uh, and so this is, and the, normally the trend is now the approach is to uh, delegate to the operator most of the, the action in the long term, in the long term. The very quick actions normally are taken, especially during accident condition, by automatic system. 
at, this is valid at true at least for the, the reactor that we are considering, a water reactor like uh, pressurized water reactor, boiling reactor. There are other other uh, type of reactors. Maybe this not uh, applies 100 percent what I said. But for this reactor, this is the trend. So the operator is requested to act for long term when the situation is already clear and less critical and, uh, uh, and the, the intervention can be correct. So the, the, the design shall be operator friendly. The, the, the working environment shall be designed according to ergonomic principles. So I should not put something that cannot be reached, you know, the switch or whatever. The human machine interface shall be designed to provide the operator with comprehensive but easily manageable information compatible with the necessary decision. So these are very general uh, requirements that uh, I just recalled in this, uh, in this introduction. Then uh, there are still other, other uh, engineering aspects that uh, uh, I did not include because this, uh, I understand this is, you know, is a heavy presentation with all these rules. But I don't have any figure here, you know, any nice picture. Just so let's uh, try to limit. But I think uh, in the coming days uh, you will uh, reconsider most of this in uh, much more detail. If I'm not wrong, this is the last one. Yes. So and I, uh, before concluding, I think uh, I think uh, that. Uh, you register the message I want to give you, as I said at the, at the opening, is that there are several factors that affect the, the safety of our plant, and you should not forget any of this. Analyzing very well accident, and making this beautiful transient, and put the frequencies is something very important, but it's not the only, the only thing. First, you have to, to do very good engineering in your plant to avoid to avoid accidents, to prevent accidents. So this is the point. Prevention first. Okay, thank you.